This is a 1982 Ford Cortina 80 or Mark V because we like that in Britain and it's one of the last in the line of one of the most famous names in the British motor industry. In the mid 70s Ford was on top of the world. The American influenced coke bottle styled Mark III Cortina was an enormous success but Ford knew their market well and understood exactly what they needed to do once the time came to replace it. Enter the Mark IV. This new car judged the public mood perfectly with its blend of familiarity and modernity. Gone was the coke bottle styling and in was a more conservative one. Ford knew how much they relied on fleet sales and tailored this car just for them. And I think Tony Bastable put it best, noting this is what Ford hope the up-to-date sales reps of the land will be driving in 77. Most of them have been driving Cortinas for years. A conservative, boxy, but really quite good looking car. It doesn't draw your attention, but when you do look, it's just right. Purposeful and modern. Not exciting, but modern enough to consolidate Ford's hold on the market. It was more aerodynamic, more stable and had better visibility than the Mark III. It addressed the problems without any risk of corrupting their success, and it worked perfectly. For a time, one in every eight new cars sold in Britain was a Cortina. Ford's biggest stroke of genius though was their economy. Underneath it was pretty much the same as the old car, and so was the interior, but Ford spent their money on where it mattered, that first impression. The Mark III was a very good car, so Ford knew they could redress it and sell it again. This gave Ford a captive audience. Mark III Cortina drivers found the Mark IV familiar, but with that modern boxy styling. However, that did mean that the Cortina very quickly started to feel a little old hat, so Ford had to keep updating it. Only three years on, they launched this car, the Cortina 80. It retained all the familiarity of the Mark IV, but with little tweaks to help keep it fresh. It's one step between a facelift and a rebody. They redressed the grievances of their customers, offering improved engines, a new grill, new lights, better rust proofing and a new roof, giving even better visibility. It's this attention to detail that kept both Ford and the Cortina right at the top of the sales charts for so long. Possibly the biggest step Ford took in rationalising things was the decision to merge the British Cortina and the European Taunus, so now both cars are identical. Underneath though, it was starting to age. The underpinnings are from 1970 with some tweaks, but they were simple, reliable and they performed well. Engine at the front, drive at the back. Discs at the front, drums at the back. Double wishbones at the front and a well-located live axle with coil springs at the back. It was all good, if not ultra-modern. This one is the 2.0-litre GL, although it has gear wheels on it because they're shiny. It also has some driving lamps in the grille. Under the bonnet of this one is Ford's 2.0-litre Pinto engine, which is a rugged old unit with an overhead cam and 99 brake horsepower, which is just over 70 kilowatts. Those underpinnings do make a soft, comfy car, and the Pinto engine may be a little bit loud and rough, but it doesn't half sound tuneful. Have a listen. The interior, carried over from the late Mark III's, is deeply conservative. Everything is functional but it's nowhere near as interesting as that in an early Mark III. To be honest, it feels a little bit weird in here because I seem to sit lower than I imagined. I also sit much closer to the door than I imagined. There's quite a large centre section and plenty of headroom, of course. The seats, as much as they're very soft, they aren't really very supportive, so you do roll about a little bit, even if it does have lovely soft headrests. These seats are blue velour, which is just wonderful. I don't know why they don't have velour seats anymore. Velour is just the best material, but yeah. It's quite nice nonetheless. The steering wheel is in a really nice position. As much as I wish it would be a little bit further away, it's still nice nonetheless, and it's a really unergonomical four-spoke design, which I suppose is nice when you're cruising down the motorway, but for adventurous driving, I'm not sure this steering wheel would be absolutely the best. 
But again, the pedals are in a nice position, even if the clutch pedal seems to have an awful lot of travel and there is no rest for your clutch foot because of the massive transmission tunnel. Now, it seems to be straddling two eras, this car, because you've got obviously this fake wood on the dashboard along with the black everywhere, but there are still little tiny hints of chrome around the place. And as I said, even five or six years later, this car might have looked a little bit outdated next to a Sierra with its really grey, plasticky interior. This is definitely of an era before. The gauges are nice and simple. You don't get a rev counter on this one. You just get a speedometer, clock, uh, fuel gauge, temperature gauge, and your basic warning lights. You did get a rev counter on gears, GLSs, GLEs, but this being a standard GL doesn't have the rev counter. Now, indicator stalk feels quite floppy really it doesn't feel like the mechanism is very good but the stalk itself is quite nice obviously indicators pretty standard horn if you push and your flash and your main beam and on the right hand side you have two stalks so this one at the back for your headlamps so that's off side lights and headlights and then your wipers so down for intermittent and then your two speeds there and then push in for wash now, in the centre, you have a very, very 70s climate control, obviously with your fake wood. Um, these very, very cheap, but also very of the period vents. And then obviously your controls, which feel like they are definitely setting something. And fan control, and then heated rear window, and hazards. Uh, cigarette lighter, pretty standard cigarette lighter and then of course ashtray taking center stage in the dashboard because of course it does a little storage area with boxes in um, and then proper old ford radio no cassette deck which is a little bit weird for a gl not to have a cassette deck but there we are and then there's a little storage area there and coin holders remember them and then your four speed gearbox you're still four speed in a cortina it would take until the sierra to get five speeds and lots of people with these Cortinas do swap in five-speed boxes from a Sierra um, just to make motorway cruising a little bit easier. Well, very fine gear change, not a particularly sporty gear change, but a really easy gear change nonetheless, and then push down for reverse. And down again, handbrake, and as much as there's quite a lot of space between the two front seats, the centre console itself doesn't seem to use all that, that space, so the center armrest storage area is really narrow even if it is quite deep of course as i said before little bits of chrome like around this mirror adjuster and on the wind up windows which are really really easy to use um and of course carpeted doors which is lovely the door handle is down here which is seems a little bit unusually low but it's nice and easy to get to nonetheless and of course you have a door pull slash armrest. Now, being in the back of one of these Cortinas is a weird experience because you sit really, really low. When I first sat here, I imagined that the springs had all gone in the seat and I just sunk to the floor, but this is apparently how it is. Uh, you do sit, again, very low. I feel quite, I feel like a child again in here really, but it means you don't really need a headrest in the back because your head had just hit the top of the seat anyway. Um, and the, driver's headrest feels very close even though I've got plenty of leg room and obviously tremendous amounts of headroom but I am very close to the back window just because of the old-fashioned saloon shape of this car it's similar in the front where you feel very very close to the windscreen just because of how cars used to be designed and of course again in the back wind up windows with your little flashes of chrome and then an ashtray because again your kids are going to be smoking in the back and they've even got a little thing for you to stub your cigarette out on how thoughtful ford were even if i have enough knee room of course one of the big thoughts with sitting in the back of a car is whether your feet slide under the front seat or not that can make being in the back of a car quite unreasonable but there's lots and lots of room underneath there lots of leg room even though the seat belt the seat belt reel does intrude a little bit so there is a little bit of a problem there but apart from that the back of the Cortina is lovely. The exterior is just right. It's not the kind of car you'd spend hours talking about because it isn't beautiful, just right. 
It blends into its surroundings while remaining smart rather than anonymous. It's the last of Ford's wedge-shaped front ends and it gives a bit of a hooded appearance. Mean but not aggressive, just purposeful. I personally see the rear lights of the Mark V as a little bit ugly compared to the smaller, more slender units of the Mark IV, but I suppose I'd just go for a Mark IV then. Personally, I really like the Mark IV and V, but I do think they're maybe a little bit boring. They don't have interesting underpinnings and the style from the older Cortinas just isn't there. It's good looking, but not as good looking as the Cavalier. It's conventional, and yes, that does make it boring, but it's exactly what made the Cortina such a massive success in the first place. I'm the kind of person that likes a car because it encapsulates the era, has an interesting story, or has interesting engineering. But the Cortina is just there. Surely that makes it a good car by default, but it doesn't quite light the fire that makes me fall in love. Mm-hmm. <laughs>